Tonight I just want to share a few thoughts that I have on being faithful, opportunities for co-responsibility in today's church. My first thought when I began to reflect on this theme was how difficult being faithful or being full of faith can be in our church today. For many, there is a mood of negativity that percolates through our communities and surrounds us in society. I believe this negativity stems from a crisis of relationship between the people in our church communities and some leaders and ministers in our church. This crisis of relationship is rooted in what I see as a most basic breach of trust. Consciously or unconsciously, the people of God have placed trust in church leaders and ministers. Because we viewed and understood these ministers and leaders as professional representatives of God here on earth, as agents of God's love. And with this trust came an expectation that such representatives of God would practice what they preached in relation to the way Christians should live their lives as followers of Jesus Christ. As professionals, our leaders and ministers were held to a higher moral standard. And rightly or wrongly, we expected more. This is a sense, of course, in which we can expect, there is a sense in which we can expect too much. Forgetting the human limitations of our church leaders, we expect them to embody the perfection of the Father to which we are all admittedly called. But in Ireland at least, we forget even now of the universal call to holiness. And we believe that ordained and religious ministers should embody all that is holy. And when those expectations are shattered, as they were with the wave after wave of revelations, this mood of negativity spread like wildfire in our communities. And I believe it became stifling, not just for those still in leadership and ministry positions, who felt the glare of the spotlight on every aspect of their lives, but for every member of the church who felt a challenge to stay committed to our faith and to our church. As Pope Francis puts it in The Joy of the Gospel, in the end, we can get caught up in things that generate only darkness and inner weariness, and things that slowly consume all zeal for the apostolate. Because of this crisis of relationship, each baptized person felt the need to reevaluate his or her church life. We needed to assess what all these revelations meant for our being and participation in the church. For many, unfortunately, this re-evaluation gave rise to their leaving the church, that is, disassociating themselves from communal worship, from the sacraments, and for some at least, from prayer altogether. Others made the equally difficult choice of staying within the fold. We felt the need to be surrounded by community, we needed communal support to sustain us in our faith. And we needed the sacraments to nourish us and to sustain us on our journey. And to a great extent, I think this negative mood is being transformed by what here you call the Francis effect. I hadn't heard that in Ireland. And I believe we have found a new source of energy in both the person and the teachings of our new Pope Francis. He is continually reminding us of the simplicity of the message we are called to spread throughout the world. He reminds us of the ordinary ways we can live out our Christian discipleship and vocations. And he does this above all by his own personal and authentic example. Pope Francis is challenging us by his example and his witness to the integrity of the Christian way of life. He embodies all that can be hoped for and expected in our leaders, that they will practice what they preach and lead us by example. And this is a great responsibility for any leader in our church. And we are inspired by the manner in which he accepts and undertakes this responsibility. But his responsibility does not negate our responsibility. 
Above all, Pope Francis hurls a very empowering and enabling message for each of us. We each have a responsibility too for the mission of the Church. Leaders alone do not hold the responsibility for all discipleship, evangelization and pastoral activity in the Church. Pope Francis reminds us that we are all called to go forth and offer everyone the life of Jesus Christ, to go out into the street and reach out to our neighbour, whoever that may be. And our neighbour could be a baptised person in faith, with faith, who may take part in communal worship, occasionally or usually. Or our neighbour could be a baptised person who no longer feels the joy of faith in their hearts, who no longer has a meaningful relationship with the church, who has left the fold. Or our neighbour could be a person who does not yet know Christ or has always rejected Christ. These are three groups that Pope Francis mentions. We each are challenged as Christians to reach out to our neighbour, whoever they are and wherever they are on their journey. We reach out to them in faith, to mediate to them the joy of the gospel, the good news that the kingdom of God is near, that we are all loved by God who wants to be one with, with us, one with us, and who became human in order to prepare the way for us to eternal life. Pope Francis is not the first Pope, of course, to preach this message, of course, responsibility. Building on the teaching of the Second Vatican Council, Pope John Paul II affirmed that, quote, the Church is directed and guided by the Holy Spirit, who lavishes diverse hierarchical and charismatic gifts on all the baptized, calling them to be, each in an individual way, active and co-responsible. At the turn of the millennium, he emphasized the need to encourage all the baptized and confirmed to be aware of their active responsibility in the church's life. Pope Benedict XVI also took up this message, reminding us especially that lay people, quote, must no longer be viewed as collaborators of the clergy, but truly recognized as co-responsible for the church's being and action. So although this message of co-responsibility of all the faithful has been a central part of the teaching of church leadership for almost half a century, perhaps longer. For many people in our church, especially lay people, this collective responsibility for being active in the mission of the church is unknown or unrealized. We are still only uncovering in each of our own contexts what the co-responsibility of all the faithful really means. There is much brokenness in our church, and we have many vulnerable members in our communities, those who are young or elderly, ill or marginalized, abused, lonely or grieving, who come from broken homes or broken relationships, who struggle to feed their families, as many are in Ireland, and who struggle to survive social conflict. These day-to-day -day hardships can drown out our Christian call to co-responsibility and lessen our zeal and enthusiasm for participating in the Church's mission. Yet we are a community of God's people, followers of Christ. For us, being in communion, united in faith and love, means that members of our community who struggle in their faith cannot be abandoned. Pope Francis reminds us that if the whole church takes up this missionary impulse, she has to go forth to everyone without exception, above all to the poor and the sick, those who are usually despised and overlooked, those who cannot repay you. May we never abandon them. We therefore have a responsibility to each other to accompany and support each other on our Christian journey. And it may be at times I am supporting others,
but at other times they are supporting me. This is the reciprocal nature of living in communion and being co-responsible. But this path of co-responsibility is not an easy path. The choice to stay in the fold, to spend much or all of our energies in building up communion among the faithful, in employing our gifts for the good of the community, and in spreading the message of the gospel through our daily encounters is a difficult choice and a challenging way of life. To paraphrase Pope Francis, it will involve getting bruised, hurt, and dirty. Because we will be out on the streets, serving our neighbors, caring for them, and tending to them in their times of need. This co-responsibility of all the faithful creates a particular challenge for those, I believe, involved in pastoral ministry in our communities. This group, if we can call it such, includes first and foremost those in professional leadership positions, such as the ordained bishops, priests and deacons, religious ministers and lay ecclesial ministers. But it also includes parish leadership teams, parish pastoral councils, or parish cluster teams. And as I see it, these leaders who collaborate in pastoral ministry have a twofold challenge. First, they have the challenge of conveying or mediating the message to the people in their communities that A, God has called everyone to active Christian discipleship, and B, God has gifted everyone for participation in Christ's mission. The second challenge they face is the challenge of providing structures, whereby people have both the means and the opportunities to exercise their gifts for the good of the community and in response to the community's needs. That is, pastoral leaders share the responsibility of enabling the people of God to take up Christ's call to co-responsibility in the church. I believe that this twofold challenge cannot be met without the community as a whole adopting two dispositions or outlooks. The first is a disposition of dialogue. In our church today, the crisis of relationship between the people in our communities and church leaders and ministers was deepened by the lack of honest and open communication, or the secrecy, as some call it, which was motiva motivated by self-preservation and the avoidance of scandal. Many view this secrecy as exacerbating the issues of church leaders not practicing what they preached. In fact, I believe secrecy, as distinct from confidentiality, especially for the sake of self-preservation, is distinctly non-Christian. Christ was born, became human, and eventually gave up his life to testify to the truth. And everyone who belongs to the truth listens to his voice. That's from the Gospel of John. The search for truth is therefore central to Christian discipleship, and we must follow Christ's example. <coughs> He never shied away from speaking the truth, even when it caused others to be hostile towards him, and even when they plotted his death. Instead, Christ was quite open in his proclamation of his message. He went out into the street and met with all different types of people, from the smallest child to the leaders of the communities, and he engaged them in dialogue. Often speaking in parables, to gently mediate his message to the people with whom he spoke. He was aware of people's personal stories, of how they struggled with sin, and how they yearned for healing. And he listened to their needs, spoken and unspoken, and responded in action. Sometimes he spoke with people in large numbers, like in the Sermon on the Mount, and sometimes in small groups, with the disciples or in people's houses, breaking bread with them and spending time getting to know them. 
At other times, he had personal, individual encounters, like with the woman at the well. Most people who encountered Jesus and dialogued with him were transformed by the experience, but there were a few, of course, whose hearts were hardened to his message. And yet he continued to convey his message to all, even if he did shape it to suit the needs of the individual with whom he spoke. He wanted to ensure that what he said would be meaningful to them in their lives. Because people respond to something they perceive as meaningful. People are motivated to participate in something when it holds real meaning for them. And the same holds true for today. So this is the example that we must follow as Christians. Christians who are co-responsible for continuing Christ's mission. We follow Christ's example when we foster a disposition to, of dialogue among the faithful. Not with the faithful or at the faithful, but dialogue among the faithful. This dialogue takes place between parishioners. Between parishioners and leaders. Between leaders themselves, between parishes, between dioceses, and between the local churches and the global church. And we also need to foster dialogue with the broader society, where we live out our daily Christian lives. Following Christ's example, such dialogue would involve accepting people where they are, recognizing their personal stories, experiences, and expectations, listening to their needs, both those that are spoken and unspoken. It would mean gently mediating Christ's message in whatever way was most suitable. Only through engaging in such dialogue can those involved in pastoral ministry hope to enable people to embrace their Christian co-responsibility, to foster the unique vocation and gifts of the people, and to stimulate them in an understanding of where their Christian faith meets their everyday life. Such dialogue mutually enriches the lives of the dialogue partners, and it takes a great deal of commitment from them to become fully effective. Some people have a great fear of this form of communication in our church. It is certainly more unpredictable, time-consuming and challenging because of the reciprocity it demands. Other methods of communication, such as announcements, news bulletins, etc., the information only flows one way. These methods are neither inspiring nor enabling. Dialogue among the faithful, I believe, is different. However, because of its unpredictability and time-consuming nature, many people shy away from it. They become paralyzed for the fear of going astray, of falling into doctrinal error, and they can be paralyzed out of mistrust or misjudgment of the other. Pope Francis suggests, however, that the fear of becoming a church that is shut up, shut up from the outside world, shielded from the plights of others, and only concerned with clinging to its own security, should prove to be a greater motivation. He calls us to go forth out into the streets, in dialogue with our neighbour, mediating the life of Christ to prevent this from happening. The second disposition that I believe communities need to adopt in order to mediate the call of discipleship and provide structures for co-responsibility is the disposition of wonder and awe in God's presence. This is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit which we receive at baptism and which is sealed and strengthened within us at, at confirmation. This gift is one of the ways we are made ready to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The word wonder has two senses here. The first is being filled with amazement in the face of God's presence. The second is to think or imagine in light of God's will. I believe nurturing this gift within ourselves 
and developing a disposition of wonder and awe in God's presence would help us deepen and change our usual wavelength in our relationships with other members of God's people. This disposition might help us to overcome the fear that paralyzes us from embracing our mission. Michael Paul Gallagher, whom some of you may know, is an Irish Jesuit theologian, and he uses the image of a skyscraper, and I think it might be useful here. He says, imagine that your life is like a skyscraper. And I thought here of the Eureka Tower here in Melbourne, which I believe has 90 plus floors. So imagine your life is like the Eureka Tower. And the elevator is only programmed to travel between a certain number of those floors. Say, for example, from floors 10 to 50. When you were younger, you were probably able to access the ground floor to floor 10. But as you got older, you grew out of these floors. And now you function sufficiently in floors between floors 10 and 50. But as long as you are happy with using just these floors, you will never fulfill your full potential. Because there are 10 floors below and at least 40 floors above that you will never use. Michael Paul Gallagher says that if you did want to use those other floors, you would need a special key. And he says that special key is imagination. For me, imagination is something we were all very much in touch with when we were children. But as we get older, we either lose or choose to abandon the wonder and awe of the imagination. Creative artists, poets, songwriters, authors, sculptors, these adults retain the key to their imagination. And with those keys, they open up a whole world to us which we might not have been able to imagine for ourselves. They can show us the extraordinary in the ordinary. And this is a lesson that children can teach us also, if we are wise enough to listen, as I do with my nephews. One of the most powerful statements, I think, in Scripture is when Christ proclaims, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Once again, the message of Christ is simple. Do not lose your sense of wonder and awe. The Spirit has given you this gift to help you fulfill your share in the responsibility for the mission of the church, to help you fulfill your human potential. In dialogue with others, do not have fear about what you will say and when you should say it. The Spirit has been given to us to guide us. So fostering a disposition of wonder and awe, which enables us to recognize and respect the presence of God in others, and allows us to imagine appropriate ways of mediating Christ's message to them in dialogue. In addition, the disposition of wonder and awe allows us to imagine the possibilities or the opportunities for structuring co-responsibility so that we can enable all members of the faithful in our community to exercise their gifts in response to other people's needs. Pope Francis incites us and encourages us in this task. He says, don't be scared. Dare to have fabulous plans. I encourage you not to be afraid to dream, to have great ideals, to be builders of hope. We are being encouraged here to use our imaginations, to dream and to plan with hope in the building up of our communities. But the disposition of wonder and awe in God's presence reminds us also whose dream we are actually sharing. We follow Christ, and Christ came to reveal the Father. Throughout his ministry, it was the will of the Father that was important. Christ pre preached what the Father thought, 
and the Father is always with Christ, and he does what pleases the Father. That too is our model in faith, to preach what the Father has taught us through his Son, and to do what pleases the Father. This is the reason we pray in the Our Father for God's will to be done. But it is sometimes hard to know what the will of God actually is. It is difficult to figure out what pleases God in modern situations when there is no precedence in scripture. Also, speaking of God's will can be off-putting for some people in today's world. For them, if we are doing something because God wills it, that means we have no freedom or ownership our sense of accomplishment for what we are doing. It's God's will, not ours. So it might be easier to think of it as God's dream, a dream that we share and consent to be involved in, a dream that we are encouraged to imagine in all of its possibilities. God has a dream for us. God has a vision for us. And God has a hope for us. And if we try and make this dream a reality, it is our free choice to do this. I was reminded of a poem recently, written by a French poet, which speaks to us of God's dream. Some of you may have heard it before. If so, I hope you enjoy hearing it again. It's simply called God's Dream. I myself will dream a dream within you. Good dreams come from me, you know. My dreams seem impossible, not too practical, not for the cautious man or woman, <coughs> a little risky sometimes, a trifle brash perhaps. Some of my friends prefer to rest more comfortably, in sounder sleep, with visionless eyes. But from those who share my dreams, I ask a little patience, a little humour. Some small courage and a listening heart. I will do the rest. Then they will risk and wonder at their daring. Run and marvel at their speed. Build and stand in awe at the beauty of their building. You will meet me often as you work. In your companions who share the risk. In your friends who believe in you enough to lend you their hands, their own hearts, to your building. In the people who stand in your doorway, stay a while and walk away knowing that they too can find a dream. There will be some fill days and sometimes it will rain. A little variety, both come from me. So come now, be content. It is my dream, you dream. My house, you build. My caring, you witness. My love, you share. And this is the heart of the matter. I think this poem captures much of the co-responsibility of the faithful for the mission of our church. Imagining the will of God, having courage in the building, listening with our hearts, taking risks together, and meeting God in our co-workers. The disposition of wonder and awe in God's presence helps us keep in touch with God's dream. Taking together the dispositions of dialogue and wonder and awe make for endless opportunities for co-responsibility in the church. For instance, my home diocese in the west of Ireland released a pastoral plan last year. And the plan goes from 2013 to 2020. So it's quite a long plan. And this plan was the result of a long and enriching and challenging series, series of dialogue conversations among the faithful in the diocese. The series of conversations and surveys provided people within the diocese from all walks of life with the opportunity to participate in the reflection on the current state of our church, but also 
of our dream for the future. I am sure you have similar initiatives that have taken place here. Out of this dialogue process at home, and the subsequent pastoral planning by a number of groups working collaboratively, and those were the Diocesan Pastoral Council, a Theological Reflection Group, and a steering committee established by the Diocesan Pastoral Council. From those, those plannings, a number of new and existing pastoral structures in the diocese are being tasked to facilitate the implementation of the pastoral plan. Those structures include the Diocesan Pastoral Council, separate groups established to lead each of the 10 strands that they identified in the plan, the Priests' Council, and a thing called the Moderators' Team, which I don't know that you have here, but they are a group of priests that are responsible for coordinating pastoral activities in clusters or pastoral areas. There were also cluster coordinating, coordinating groups, which include lay people as well as the professional leaders, and parish pastoral councils, which are the same, except based in parishes. These structures will ensure further structures are put in place at more local levels to enable the people to be as co-responsible for the implementation of the plan as they were in its formulation. It is through processes of dialogue such as these which gives the faithful room to speak, reflect, dream, imagine and plan that will provide our churches with the opportunities for co-responsibility. The process of enabling people has already begun when they are active participants in the dialogue. Pastoral leaders have the responsibility for ensuring that other members of the faithful are given sufficient opportunity to participate in dialogue at every stage. Through doing that, the mission of the church will truly be a communal effort.